we'll get started. Uh, good morning. I'm Harish Bhutani. I work at SAP. And today I'm going to talk about uh, SQL windowing and table functions, which uh, work on top of Hive. So the agenda of the talk is going to be, I'm first going to uh, talk about why we've done this thing, so what are PTFs. So a central concept in our solution is partition table functions, and talk about that, talk about why they are interesting. And then I'll get into our solution and hopefully give a demo. And uh, very briefly talk about the implementation, then expand a little bit on this concept of PTFs, talk about multipass and recursive algorithms, and finish with uh, next steps and summary. So, so what are PTFs? So this is not a new concept. It's PTFs are essentially functions which can appear where a table can in SQL, and the contract is table in, table out. And the way they uh, divide work is they partition the input and optionally order the input. So each uh, PTF instance uh, operates on a partition. So well, it's very similar to MapReduce, but it predates MapReduce. And PTFs are available in many databases, for example, Oracle, Aster, DB2, etc. So why are PTFs interesting? So what are the kinds of things you can do with PTFs? So here's a set of things. So uh, here's a set of patterns you can do with them. So you can do uh, aggregations on partitions. So for example, you want to rank within manufacturer by price. Or if you're looking at census data, you want to list the top three census tracts within a county by land area. You can do inter-row calculations, so you can do time series analysis, so you want to find occurrences where a flight was more than 15 minutes late five or more times in a row. Uh, the other kinds of things you can do are you can do market basket analysis. You've heard about market basket analysis a lot during the summit. So essentially, you're looking for items which occur frequently together, and you know this algorithm can be generalized. So for example, you can look for all the web pages visit, visited together in a session. And I'll talk a little bit more about this uh, use case. And another set of use cases are graph algorithms. So in, C in the SQL context, these are implemented as recursive queries. And essentially, you're looking for paths within graphs, interesting paths within graphs. So for example, you're looking for lowest cost routes between two cities. And in this context, we are, all of these analyses should be expressible in SQL, and they should be expressible as table functions. OK, and I, the, the, I listed these uh, use cases because I'm going to talk a little bit, of, little bit more about each of them, but there are many more use cases. So for example, Aster has the SQL MapReduce, MapReduce function library, and they have all kinds of very interesting analysis you can do using that library. OK, so, so you know, just to set well, what this talk is about, so the bottom line for PTFs are they enable more interesting questions more simply. They enable analysis sometimes not expressible in SQL, or they simplify specifying analysis. They foster reuse, and they enable bridging to external en engines. So I'll talk about the bridging concept. And the key thing is app developers expect and re rely on these, this framework in other databases. So our goal was to see if we can provide a similar kind of framework and similar kind of experience in, uh, uh, on top of Hive. OK, so just quickly, how does a PTF invocation look in SQL? So again, back to our old friend market basket. So the input is. A, ba a basket table, so you have rows uh, listing. Uh, each row represents an item within a basket. What you want as an output is uh, item sets which appear frequently in these baskets. And the way you uh, execute this query is you invoke this function called frequent item sets. You tell it that the input to it is this basket table. You tell it how to divide work, how to partition the data. And then you give it other arguments. So in this case, you're saying that uh, this notion of support threshold, so you're saying that things which are interesting should appear at least in 15% of the baskets. So once you've done that, a function can appear anywhere a table does. And then you, know, you can write regular SQL. In this example, it's really simple. 
all it's doing is it's saying that once the function finishes, just output what the function has uh, computed. So, pretty simple interface in SQL. Okay, how how does this relate to SQL windowing? So, just to give a uh, you know just to jog your memory on SQL windowing, they let you express aggregations on partitions, and further they let you express uh, aggregations on windows around a row. So it's possible to do row specific aggregations using windowing clauses. And the kinds of things you do with windowing is you can do ranking, aggregation, navigation, statistics, and the kinds of analysis people do is cumulative sums, delta analysis, ratios, etc. So, so here's a simple example of SQL windowing. So it's sales data, you group by channel and month, and then you want to rank the data. Uh, for each channel, you want to rank the data by month. You want both to rank and dense rank. And you also want the rank over all months across all channels. So that's how you would specify this using SQL windowing. So you have these three windowing clauses associated with this SQL. So the key observation is the way this query gets processed. So conceptually, the, everything else gets executed in the uh, SQL. So all the group by having uh, joins, uh, everything happens. And then on the result set, you apply these uh, windowing functions. And you apply these windowing functions partition by partition. So each windowing function specifies how the result set should be partitioned. And then you know it, it's given a partition, and it, it, it outputs its result. So it's very, very similar to how PTFs work. And so the obvious observation is if all the uh, windowing clauses in a SQL statement have the same uh, partition and order expression, then it becomes, uh, it becomes a PTF invocation. So here in the middle I'm showing, which is not SQL, but basically I'm just highlighting this point. So assume that the rank over all channels was not in the query. So all the windowing clauses had the same partition and order by. So what I'm highlighting is first we do the everything else, in this case the group by. And then what we are saying is in this case we partition, the partitioning of the data gets associated with the result set. And it doesn't need to be associated with each windowing clause. And then each windowing clause gets the same partition to work with. And then if we try to put this in PTF form, assume that there's this new function called windowing table function. And it's got the same kind of uh, uh, it's got the same kind of structure. So the input to it is a query, in this case a group by query, and then you tell it how to partition the data, maybe optionally order it, and then the arguments to this function are the windowing clauses. So so that's how windowing gets related to PTFs. So and our solution is exactly at this level. All the windowing clauses have to have the same partition by and order by. It's easy for us to support multiple orderings, but to support multiple partitions, we would have to do a little bit more work. OK, so let me now jump in and talk about our solution. So us, in order to use our solution, you need to download this uh, windowing jar, and you need to drop it into the hivelib directory. And you need to set up this windowing CLI uh, shell script. And once you do that, you can use this uh, solution in a special CLI mode, and you can also use it as an API mode. So in CLI mode, you start this. You, you start the CLI mode by saying the special mode called hive dash dash service windowing CLI. And what you get in this mode is you can enter both uh, HQL queries and these new kinds of uh, PTF queries. And so this mode embeds Hive. So if you give it a HQL query, it's going to just hand it over to Hive. If you run one of our queries, then it talks to Hive both to get metadata and to uh, run any embedded Hive queries inside our queries. So, uh, so in our queries, you can refer to Hive tables, and you can embed Hive queries. And I'll show examples of that. And the way our PTS work is very similar to Hive. It translates them into MapReduce jobs. And in the MapReduce jobs, it uses the Hive survey mechanics to convert raw data into structure. And I'll talk a little bit more about that also. OK, so just to give you, uh, you probably guessed this already, just to 
uh, say this one more time, the structure of our qu queries are really simple. The input to the query is a function table invocation and then you can filter and project the output coming out of the function table invocation. And the function table invocation has these three things. The input to it can be a hive table, it can be a hive query or it can be another PTF. So this way you can chain PTFs together. And then you specify how to partition and optionally order the input and then you may give it other arguments. Okay. And there's and not shown here is the fact that the output of this can be written to a hive table, a hive partition. And it's reasonable to ask that can this form flow into, can this be a subquery in, in a hive query? And the answer is not yet. That's because we sit on top of hive and we don't uh, uh, run inside hive yet. Okay. And the only uh, uh, variation to this simple form is when you specify windowing queries, uh, windowing clauses. So in that case, you don't uh, invoke a function. You, you say from an input, you say how to partition an order by, and you use this with keyword to specify a bunch of uh, windowing clauses. But the thing to note is that's just syntactic sugar. It's really equivalent to calling the special windowing table function. Okay, so let me give a few uh, uh, examples of our solution. So the first one is really simple. You want to rank parts within manufacturer by part. So this is, a, this is on the TPCH part table. So the input is the part table. It has manufacturer name, part name, price, among other things. And the output you want is to list the output by manufacturer. Within each manufacturer, you want to list parts in descending order by price and then give the rank. And the way you write the query is straightforward. You say from the part table, you partition by manufacturer, and then each partition should be ordered by price. And uh, within each partition, compute this windowing uh, function called rank. And the takeaway from this is without windowing, it's not so straightforward to specify in SQL. So it's, you would probably do it this way. You would say first compute the rank by manufacturer and price across all manufacturers. Then you would uh, compute the min ra rank for each manufacturer and then join the first two things to compute the rank for, for each part within a manufacturer. But in the windowing form, it's very straightforward to specify. Okay, so I'm gonna try and give you a demo of this. So with the screen resolution, it's going to be interesting. Okay, I have set up an environment with uh, SQL windowing setup. So as I said, this is the thing I do. I just say hive dash dash service. Starts up just like Hive, uh, the Hive CLI, just to prove to you that you can do any commands that you can do in Hive CLI. So just doing a show tables, and I'm just going to do this so that it outputs the, the output of this query or on the command line. And this is the query that I just showed you, which was on the uh, part table. I want to rank by manufacturer. And in this case, I'm writing to a temp table. I could have written to a hive table, but in this case, I'm writing to a temp table. So I'm just going to run this here. So hopefully this runs quickly. So we are should look very familiar to how Hive queries are run. It's giving you feedback on what stage it's in and stuff like that. So it finished the map and it's on the reduced side where the ranking is gonna happen now. And hopefully it should come back in a few seconds. Okay. 
Okay, so just to quickly show you that it did the stuff. So, so it's showing you the rows listed by manufacturer, and then it's giving the part name, then the price in descending order, and then the rank. And then, you know, it's give manufacturer one, then two, and so on, et cetera. So I'll come back and show more details about this, but for now, I'm just going to start this query. This is the, more, this is the market basket uh, query. I'm just going to start it and come back to it when I talk about market basket analysis. Okay, a couple of more examples. So that was a really simple example, a little bit more complex example. So this one is on census data, and we want to compute the top three tracks by county, but, and the measure used is land area. So just a little bit of information on the census data. This is being run on geo header. The geo header is the geography dimension of the census table, and it contains multiple hierarchies and levels. And the way you identify uh, which level uh, row belongs to is by the summary level table. So the way, this, uh, the, way the input is structured is you have, in this case, I'm, the first row is a tract level row because the summary level is 140, and the second row is a county level row. So you have the input, there are lots of more columns, I'm just showing the relevant information here. So you have county uh, tract level information, and the information we are looking at is area land. So what you want in the output is, you want by county, you want to list the top three tracks for those tracks, and you are ordering them obviously in descending order. For those tracks here, I'm listing cumulative area. So the first one is 300, next is 550, and so on. So it's it would have been really easy to show percent of total county area also. But so. We, Anyway, so the, query, the things I want to highlight about the query is, first of all, the, the input to this query is a Hive query. And then you're saying how to partition the uh, data and how to order it. So in this case, you want to work on county by county. The way you specify cumulative area is you specify a window. So here you're saying from the beginning up to this row, so unbound and proceeding up to current row. And then the way you do top end, you say you restrict the output of the partition to just the top three rows. Okay. Okay. The first two examples were windowing uh, uh, examples of windowing clauses. Let me give an example of a pure PTF. So the PTF I'm going to talk about is NPath. NPath look, lets you look for patterns in time. So the way you specify patterns in time is you, the first thing you do is you assign labels to rows. So you, you, assign, you, you say that, for example, if you're looking at flights data, you say anything which has an arrival delay more than 15 minutes, uh, label it as late. And once you define these labels, you can, uh, you can uh, define patterns using these labels. So these are simple regexes. And so, for example, you can, if you want to say look for occurrences where a flight is five or more times late, you would say something like this. Say something like this to specify the pattern. <coughs> and then these occurrences are sets of rows, so you can define aggregation calculations on them. So if you have a set of occurrences of late, you can say compute the average delay of these late occurrences, or compute the number of delays. Right? So the thing to note is this is not a simple function to implement behind the scenes, but from a user perspective, it's still just a function invocation, and the execution model also fits into the PTF model. It's being, uh, uh, the, the function is being executed partition by partition. So these patterns, these labels, patterns, et cetera, are being uh, computed partition by partition. So in our solution, this is how it looks. So the exact query is, find incidences where the flight has been to New York has been more than 15 minutes late five or more times. So the things to observe in the query is, first of all, the input is a HQL query, and we want to restrict it just to flights to New York. Uh, we are looking at data flight by flight, because that's what we are looking for. We are looking for patterns on flight by flight. The, the three uh, uh, 
arguments here are specifying the labels, patterns, and uh, the aggregation expressions, as I explained. And so the output, for example, the first row is saying flight 1017 to Boston was late eight times in a row. The average delay was about an hour. And the date this happened was 25th October. Okay. So the takeaway from this is this is very hard to do in SQL. Actually, not even sure if you can do this in SQL. And the thing to remember is these labels and patterns are specified when the query is at query execution time. So the window of analysis is dynamic. Okay. Okay, so just to, so I gave several examples and just to give you a summary of what's available today. So for windowing functions, there are 21 functions available. You can do ranking, aggregation, navigation, statistics. Uh, the windows you specify can be both row-based and value-based. So you can say five preceding, seven succeeding, that's row-based. Or you can say five less and seven more, which is value-based. And value-based is more uh, numeric value-based. Uh, we support PTFs, so I just showed you NPATH. We are working on more uh, PTFs, and uh, they are in the bucket of dimensional analysis, so things like allocations, deallocations. There's more details on the wiki about this. And then there is this whole class of PTFs called multipass. We have a, uh, we have partial implementation of market basket analysis, and I'll show you more details about this. And we plan to do generalized transitive closure. And we are always looking for input from people on what else they need. Okay, very, very briefly, so how is how are PTFs, how is our solution executing these PTFs? PTFs, so hopefully not a big surprise. We are, so first of all, we use the Hive survey mechanics to convert raw data into uh, structured data into rows, and then we use the shuffle mechanics to both partition and sort the data, and you know, hand the, the data gets handed over to a PTF. On the reduced side, the way it operates is partition by partition, and a partition is. Uh, is essentially a collection of rows. And it's like a hive row. It's got both the raw data and also the object inspector associated with it. The difference here is that the execution, the evaluation, evaluator today is Groovy. So these things are expressed in Groovy. They are exposed in Groovy. And the other thing is when you do these evaluations, the context of evaluation always specifies the current row, the current partition, and if you're, if you're doing windowing functions, the current window. And then the, the interface for PTFs have obvious uh, functions in this. You, you, a PTF can specify the, it's responsible for the shape of the output. And you know, there's an execute function that you need to implement. It takes in a partition, outputs a partition. Uh, the other things about it, I'll talk in the context of multipass. So PTFs can operate both on the map side and the reduce side. And there's lots of details on this on GitHub. OK, so before I get into this, let me see if that thing finished. And let me show you the output. OK, yeah, this thing looks like it got stuck. OK, sorry about that. So, so I'm running a, in a VM. and. Sometimes the VM is, it doesn't do what I wanted to do. Anyway, so, so anyway, what I wanted to show you was in market basket analysis, when I executed that query, the output was the, the the output was in this form. It was a JSON uh, string format. And so we went from a structured table of baskets to a form which contained, uh, uh, each row contained a item set. And it's expressed in JSON form. So you had, it, it's saying that this is you know supermarket data. So it's saying that when people bought apples, they also bought baguettes. And when, they, and when people bought apples, they bought corn, beef, Etc. So, so then the question is, how did we get from this? Uh, 
how did we get from this you know basket table to this form right so and what, how how does this relate to ptfs so let me talk a little bit about that so so far we've talked about one pass ptf so they operate on the input once and they act on the input after it's been partitioned but there are use cases where you want to operate on the input multiple times and so in the one pass case each partition gets executed in, uh, independently so you know it's reasonable to say certain algorithms want to consolidate this output and then once they've consolidated the output and learned something from the output they want to do another pass on the input okay and an important uh, subclass of such problems are graph algorithms and in sql they are exposed as recursive queries i'll talk about that a little bit so in the context of our talk our solution there are two things we need to answer one is when we do multi pass pts does the interface change is it still just a function invocation and then how much does the execution model change can we tweak the execution model a little bit and uh, support these kinds of functions or it's a major change okay so the first thing is the uh, from our execution model perspective we can here's a way we can uh, support multi pass uh, ptfs so what we do is we know we are going to operate on the input multiple times so we initially partition it and persist the partition partitions and then we repeat so we we operate on this partition data many times so depending on the algorithm it may be a fixed number of times or that may be uh, defined dynamically so now in this case the difference is we operate on the data on the map side so we do this partition to partition map on the map side and we use the shuffle to con consolidate output from all the part output partitions and then we uh, the output may then drive the next uh, next pass on the input so the output from one pass may be used as input in the next pass but the user interface doesn't need to change for 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 the user it's still a function invocation and he's saying how the input should be partitioned so he's saying how the input work should be divided and how the input optionally should be sorted and one thing is this stuff is not completely ready we're still working on multi pass mechanics okay so this is just a picture this just this this just shows what i just described so the first thing we do is partition and optionally order and persist it and then we uh, repeat this process so in this case now we operate on the partitions on the map side we use the shuffle to consolidate output across partitions and then the output may drive the next pass okay so now let's talk about frequent about market basket analysis so if, uh, market basket analysis is a two pass algorithm so this algorithm is described by these three guys son and the way it's all done is in the first pass you do frequent item sets at each for each partition independently and then you consolidate all the frequent item sets and then you do a second pass on the input to eliminate all false negatives so i'm not going to go into the details of the algorithm but uh, just assume that this is this if you do this you you get a right answer so there it's a it's a complex algorithm and you know a couple of things to observe is the number of potential item sets is exponential and there are lots of interesting algorithms to compute this the one we've implemented is dynamic item counting and that's considered a efficient algorithm and you can read about details in the, at the wiki so the the thing to observe from this is the this is not a big jump from one pass and the reasons are first of all the output of the first pass is relatively small compared to the input so you may have millions or billions of transactions but the number of frequent item sets the candidate frequent item sets is going to be small so even though you have to read read them in the next pass that's not a big cost and the second thing is it's just two passes okay so so it's reasonable to say we can support this algorithm in our framework so so this is how it looks today 
So as I said, you have the input basket data and what you're expecting are these item sets as JSON strings. Uh, there is, so there's something odd about the way this is specified. So what's happening is the implementation is leaking here in this interface. So what the input to this is saying, distribute the data by the basket. And then on each iteration, you have to uh, sh uh, partition by the item sets, being the candidate item sets. So that's just the artifact of our implementation today. Ultimately, we want to get to a stage on the right-hand side where for the user, it's just a call on this function. And he says, operate on this basket table and then partition by baskets, okay? Okay, now really quickly, so the next class of problems are well, recursive queries. So these are basically used to implement uh, graph algorithms. And the heart of these are to discover and select paths. And in the context of SQL, assume there's a table R, which contains a source and destination among other information about edges. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna go a little fast now. So, so this is not new stuff. There's a lot of work done in the database community on this for years and years. So the, what people have done is to parallelize these algorithms, the partition work, but in the case of recursive queries, it's also critical that you reduce communication because the number of parts in a graph are a lot more than the edges. So in this case, the output in each iteration could be large. And off late, there's revival of interest in this. There's the Hadoop project, which looks, which models these as uh, relation-based implementation. And then you have the Giraffe project, which looks at them as matrix-based uh, algorithms. So what does this have to do with PTFs, right? So first of all, the first thing, yeah, I won't go into too much detail here. The first thing is the naive way we can do it is we can say, yeah, this is, this fits very well into the multi-pass PTF framework. The thing is on the map side, now we are doing a map side join. So we are doing joins to discover new paths. And the, on the reduce side, what we are doing is we are removing duplicate paths. So we are, at the end of a pass, we only have new paths that we've discovered. So from a PTF perspective, first of all, the interface doesn't change. And I'll talk about this in a couple of minutes. But from an implementation perspective, our implementation may not be great. So what we want to look at is, under the covers, we, may, we, look, we still expose the same interface, but we use Haloop or Giraffe to implement these algorithms. Okay, so why are these important? Right, so what's so great about them? So first, a simple example. So here's a flights table again. So you have source and destination, and you want to find all routes, possible routes. So, so here, for example, I'm listing that there's a path from, there's a route from New York to Bombay. So but this is a pretty simple, boring example, right? So here's a more interesting example. So the same flights table, but now I want to find best routes from New York to Bombay. And what I have conditions, so I want the wait times at individual points to be at most between two and five hours, and I want to pick the lowest flight, but I'm willing to pay a premium of $100 for a direct flight. So the point of all this is this kind of query can be expressed as a generalized transitive closure query. And the way you do that is there are, uh, that, a, a class of problems which can be generalized to specifying three things. How paths are joined, how you compute attributes on these paths. So paths are basically edges. They are a set of edges. And how do you select mul between multiple paths? So this kind of query, so this is essentially a shortest path query, can be exposed as a PTF. And you know, I won't go into the details, but this thing here is specifying the arguments to do this. And this is not new work. This has been done long, long back. So just Google for Shaldar. He did a great PhD thesis on this. OK, so just to uh, conclude now, so if nothing else, this, is, this should be your takeaway, YPTF. So uh, you sh it makes writing interesting uh, analysis much easier. And sometimes things which you can't do in SQL, it fosters reuse and bridging. So we talked about Haloop and Giraffe. 
And then this is what application developers already expect in other databases, so it's reasonable to say it will be helpful in Hive. Okay, there's a bunch of things we need to do. There's, you know, first of all, we want to clean up the SQL interface, make it more standards based, the evaluations. So all the runtime today is our own custom stuff. We want to move to Hive. And there's this a reasonable question is we should, why aren't we part of Hive? So there's a step by step plan on doing this and there are details on this. The first two steps to do this would be to clean up the SQL interface and to remove all the uh, groovy stuff that we have. And then there's work to flush out the functional library and you know to flush out the multipass and recursive query mechanics. And that's it. Uh, so if, if you need more information, you can read about it at the wiki or send me an e email. Okay. Thanks for listening. Thank you. So yeah, if you have any questions, please use the mic. You said this couldn't be in a subquery, but can it be a part of a join? Sorry, I couldn't hear you. You said that your PTFs can not be in a subquery, but can they be in a join? No, no. So what I meant was they cannot, uh, the output of the PTF today sits on top of HQL. So a reasonable thing to expect would be that, you know, you have a PTF invocation and then that drives an HQL query. So you take the output and drive, you know, do something else with it. So that you can't do today because we are sitting on top of HQL. Right, so the, the top of our query has to be always be a PTF chain. Whereas if, we were, if you had PTF mechanism inside HQL, then you could mix, you, you could have the orders could be mixed. You could have a PTF call and then, you know, that could then join to another uh, Hive table. So that you can't do today. Okay, thank you.